Hey guys, welcome back to Tag and Track. Today we're going to be talking about what General George Patton called the greatest battle implement of all time. The United States M1 Garand. One Garand and the men who wielded it forever changed the history of the world. This is a rifle whose impact cannot go overlooked and cannot be understated. It served everywhere from North Africa and Italy to the beaches of Normandy on D-Day, as well as the invasion of Okinawa and other Japanese-held islands, and went on to serve the U.S. forces throughout their fight with communism against North Korea. So today we're going to be continuing our World War II series with the Garand. Uh, we're going to be taking all of these guns, putting them up against each other head to head in a competition. But before we do that, we needed to cover the history and design of these firearms. So today with the Garand, we're going to take a look at the designer, the history, uh, the design itself. And then we're going to take a look at this rifle as an individual. It's going to be a fairly long video, so don't forget, down there at the bottom, we'll have everything divided out for you if you want to skip around. The M1 Garand was designed by Mr. Garand. Now, before we get to the whole debate here, I'm going to leave it simply as this. The rifle is traditionally pronounced Garand, whereas the designer is Garand. Now, whether the rifle is properly named or not, that's a subject for a totally different debate. So with that out of the way, let's talk about Mr. Garand. Mr. Garand was born in 1888 to a family of 12 in Quebec, Canada. So he's an immigrant to the United States, and in my opinion, the best thing to come out of Canada since maple syrup. So he went to work for Springfield in 1917 and continued to work for Springfield until 1953. So, long history as a gun designer, several other members of his family became inventors as well. However, he was the only one who went into firearms. And that came from a true love and passion for firearms. Growing up, he worked in a shooting gallery. So, had a long history with firearms, was an avid marksman and shooter himself. So, when it came time to develop a rifle, he really put the shooter first and it shows. So he became a U.S. citizen in 1916, and prior to entering uh, into firearms development, he worked as a machinist. So he's a, got a background as a shooter and as a machinist. This is an excellent combination for somebody to design a rifle. So Mr. Garin worked on several semi-automatic designs. Um, this particular rifle, um, was probably the first successful semi-automatic in the world and was most definitely the first major adoption of a military power of a semi-automatic firearm and putting eight rounds of 30-06 into the hands of the American soldier was a recipe for a truly war-winning combination. So several other rifles that he worked on um, including a different variant of the M1 Garand. So when these rifles went to trials for the U.S. Army, they had this rifle chambered in 30-06 and in a 2.76 intermediate cartridge. The 2.76 intermediate cartridge is quite possibly the cartridge that we should have had. But intermediate cartridge adoption uh, by the U.S. will have to wait quite a while. Uh, it takes a while for the U.S. to see the light in that. But uh, the 2.76 M1 won the trials competition. But in typical U.S. Army fashion, the better rifle did not get adopted. This rifle got adopted. Now, it wasn't um, completely out of error. The U.S. is using the 30 6 caliber in the existing 1903 Springfields. Uh, they're using them in the BARs. They're using them in the Browning 1919s. So this is a cartridge that the U.S. has, and one of the reasons this system worked so effectively throughout the war was the logistics that the U.S. had to be able to supply it. And one of the reasons a lot of other countries stayed with bolt actions is they were worried about their soldiers wasting ammunition. 
the US had the infrastructure and was able to deliver the cartridges to the frontline soldier to where ammo expenditure was not nearly as big of a deal as it was for many of the other countries. They had the ammunition and they could get it there. And that made all the difference. So let's talk a little bit about the design and how the M1 Garand actually operates. So we're gonna start all the way at the muzzle work our way all the way back to the butt of the rifle. Up here on the front of the rifle, we've got the gas system. And this is something that changed over time. The early Garands had what was called a gas trap system. And actually past the end of the barrel was a gas siphoning mechanism that brought gases off, uh, off the barrel once the bullet had actually left the end of the barrel rather than drilling and tapping the barrel. You gotta remember this is one of the first semi-automatic rifles to really see major service and it was thought that drilling a hole in the barrel would decrease the uh, lifespan of the barrel through the gases escaping through the hole that hole would eventually grow bigger and that it would weaken the barrel's strength now all of those are somewhat true what we found out over time is that it's not enough of an issue to warrant making a design change for up here in the front We've got our sights. They're pretty standard issue sights. We've got nice little wing protectors here on the side of them. And these are gonna look really good through this rear aperture that we'll talk about in just a second. We've got a fully wrapped hand guard right here. That's a very comfortable place to rest your off hand and will protect the shooter from this barrel getting hot. We also have a bayonet lug down here on the bottom. Remember World War II bayonets were still thought to be essential. It's one of those things that uh, kind of fades out over time, but at this point in time, bayonets will st were still thought to be an important part of a rifle's design. We also have lugs right here um, for a rifle sling, and we'll see three of them on this particular rifle. Right back here, we've got the op rod for the rifle. This is actually going to move as the gun is fired. So this is one of those things that you need to be sure isn't in the way of hitting something because it's gonna cycle every time around is fired. One of the things that I wanna point out with this rifle as a shooter is how good its balance is. Yes, it is a heavy rifle weighing in just over nine pounds, but it is incredibly well balanced and that nine pounds of weight really helps absorb the recoil from the hefty 30-06 round in which it fires. Very, very good balance, very good feel to this rifle as you shoot it. Now, as we get back here towards the action, this is where we see some very interesting design choices. So this op rod, as it goes backwards here, we'll see it's gonna fling around and with enough force, it's going to eject the M block clips. So this is an M block clip. It is inserted into the rifle with eight rounds of ammunition into the rifle and it ejects every time the rifle becomes empty. Then you proceed to load it again. Now loading a Garand is a notorious event. So I'm going to take this snap cap here. So in order to load it properly, as a right-handed shooter, you would take the full M-block clip, stick it into the action, use your hand to keep the op rod from moving, push it down. We'll go ahead and do that here. And then we'll see if I can do this without getting grand thumb. And you guys be able to see it. And this will then come forward, slam home on the round, and now rifle's fully loaded and ready to go. I am a left-handed shooter, and this rifle is rather difficult to handle as a left-hander. Now, one of the common myths on the M1 Garand is that it can't be unloaded with rounds in it, and that's not true. We've got this little latch right here on the side to where if we pull it open, we can then hit this latch and it will eject the in-block clip. And you can do that to top off the rifle. 
if you wanted to. However, standard doctrine was to run them all the way dry and then reload them with a full uh, full in block clip of another eight rounds. On the bottom of the trigger guard here, we see the safety. Now this safety is one of the features that I actually don't like about the rifle because it's inside the trigger guard. Push it backwards to that position, the rifle is now safe. Push it forward, the rifle is now on fire. But in order to push it forward, you have to put your finger in the trigger guard. It's not a feature that I'm particularly happy with on a rifle, but all in all, this is a fantastic, fantastic firearm. Back here on the site, we have a really, really nice rear aperture sight. It's also adjustable for windage and for distance, and it's set up for a reasonable distance settings. So as we look at other World War II rifles, they're set up to impossible distances, up to 2,000 meters, and that is simply not reasonable for an iron-sighted firearm. This rifle, the sights are incredibly good, they're incredibly easy to use, and they're set up for realistic distances. So as we go backwards, we'll see this stock right here. Um, I wish I could let you guys feel how good this stock fits up against your cheek, how well it molds into your shoulder. This was a stock that was designed by someone who shot often and really knew how to design a stock for a shooter. And it is an exceptionally good stock. It feels great. The balance on this rifle is great. The sights are great. And eight rounds of 30-06 in World War II for a standard infantry rounds, that's a lot of firepower. Put it in the hands of someone who knows how to use it, it is most definitely a deadly weapon system. And we'll see these used well past World War II. We talked a little bit about their use in Korea, but these things are still popping up in conflict zones today and are still effective today. Might be a little bit outdated, but effective nevertheless. So with the design and the designer out of the way, let's talk about this particular rifle. This particular rifle is a Springfield Armory produced. There were several manufacturers during the war. But this particular one is made by Springfield. It was made in 1944, towards the beginning of the year. And this rifle is all period correct with one exception. It has a replacement bolt. It's a 1956 model bolt that is in this particular rifle. And odds are this bolt was replaced at some point during the Korean War. So this rifle, like many others, probably saw service in both World War II and Korea. With that being said, it's still in exceptionally good shape. And we'll take a look at this thing. This one came from the CMP. This was out of their service grade. Um, it was $750 purchased from the CMP. And if you guys are looking for an M1 Garand, go buy one from the CMP. Um, I actually went and picked this one up. I got the opportunity to go to the Aniston Distribution Center for the CMP and actually pick out my particular rifle. And the Korean War replacement bolt in this rifle is one of the reasons I wanted this rifle, just because it's got a little bit more history to it. These are fantastic shooters. Uh, I was able to pick this one up in 2018 for $750 from the CMP. Um, so really quite a good deal. Uh, very, very good shooting rifle. This has a muzzle reading of a 1 plus and a throat reading of a 3 plus. That's one of the advantages from buying from the CMP is they do a lot of homework. They have an armorer look over these and they can give you some detailed information on the particular rifle you're buying. So if you're interested in one of the M1s, that is definitely the place to get one. There are a few hoops that you have to jump through in order to get one from the CMP, but overall the best way to do it. And we'll take a look down this rifle from one end to the other, but overall this rifle is in incredibly good shape, very accurate, very good shooter, and I expect this to stand up very well in our competition. This, um, this and the M1 carbine that isn't here yet, we're borrowing the M1 carbine, so we're kind of waiting on it to come in in order to shoot our videos here, 
but uh, this and the M1 carbine are my favorites to win the competition and I really think that these are by far one of the best main battle rifles of the war and it's been a pleasure to own and shoot this rifle and I highly suggest if you have the opportunity you have the ability to own one of these go get one from the CMP and get them before before they're all gone um, with that being said the CMP is also offering 1911s um, they're on a lottery they're rather hard to get but go check out the CMP for 1911s as well guys thanks for checking us out today on tack and track don't forget to subscribe we got a bunch more of this style of content coming and that competition of all these World War II rifles is coming up just as soon as we can get all of these rifles covered and we can get the borrowed firearms in. Thanks for checking us out on Tack and Track, guys.